Hello and welcome to The Pulse. As if you didn't know, July 1st marks the 20th anniversary of the Hong Kong SAR. Streets and tunnel entrances have been decked out in a sea of red flags and communist-style welcoming banners for President Xi Jinping's three-day visit. It is Mr Xi's first visit to Hong Kong since becoming China's leader in 2012. Some areas of Admiralty and Wan Chai are in a state of lockdown, with roads closed and massive barricades erected to shield the bigwigs. Plus, of course, stringent security checks. In part two of this show, the first of our specials on the 20th anniversary of the handover, a report from our producer, Nina Lowe, who interviewed Hong Kong's last governor, Chris Patton, in London this week. First, though, the arrival of President Xi. <laughs> This week marks Chinese President Xi Jinping's first visit to Hong Kong since he became China's leader. Around 11,000 police officers, more than a third of the force, have been deployed to protect the VIP. Hundreds of water-filled barriers have been set up in the area in which C and his retinue are staying. Many also note that the security measures also effectively screen the president from any displays of public sentiment that have not been carefully stage-managed. Throughout the week, protesters have been staging demonstrations calling for the release of human rights advocate Liu Xiaobo, recently revealed to have terminal cancer, and permission for the long-imprisoned Nobel laureate to reconnect with the outside world. Instead of responding to any such sensitive issues as human rights, Xi chose to hit out at those who have raised the spectre of Hong Kong independence. <laughs> Zhong 这是青年学生, C also praised Lang Chunying's administration for its achievements in housing, alleviating poverty, looking after the elderly, technological improvements and social stability. There was, to no one's great surprise, no mention of events such as the disappearance of booksellers, the abduction of a Hong Kong-based billionaire, or the disqualifications of lawmakers, all of which have reduced public confidence in promises of one country, two systems, and a high degree of autonomy. <laughs> Time and again, the Standing Committee and the, even the Hong Kong as our government said that um, the power of interpretation is not exercised um, uh, frequently. It's only exercised sparingly by the Standing Committee to resolve problems which we ourselves cannot resolve. Now, secondly, you cannot interpret our basic law as something which was not in the legislative intention or legislative purpose. It cannot change the law. Well, with me in the studio are Ronnie Tong, a new member of the Executive Council, and we also have a former member of the Hong Kong Basic Law Drafting Committee, Martin Lee. Ronnie Tong, can I come to you first? Do we have much to celebrate in 20 years of the SAR? Well, I think we are all a little bit wiser. I think we uh, understand the basic law and the concept of one country, two systems a little bit more. It does not necessarily mean that every, everybody is very happy about it. Uh, I dare say even Beijing is not happy about it. <laughs> uh, so I think one just has to take a realistic look at what has happened and hope that everybody has learned uh, a lesson or two 
that would help us to get on with the next 30 years. Well, one of the lessons you say you've learned um, is that before we can have constitutional change, Hong Kong needs to enact um, Article 23. No, 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 no. I, I didn't say that. I mean, this is the, the beauty of modern day media. Uh, I didn't say that at all. I'm saying these two factors in some way are connected. Uh, 20 years after the handover, a lot of people would think that there are still two pieces missing in this overall jigsaw puzzle about one country, two systems. From Beijing's point of view, is the enactment of a legislation under Article 23. For people of Hong Kong, is the development of democracy. But the truth is, even if everybody decides that we should have one thing after the other, I think there might there still might have to be some understanding that one would follow the other. And in that sense, uh, you know, you then have to decide, you know, what is the, the, the priority in time, not priority in the importance of okay. how these two issues should be tackled. Now, for many, many years, I also took Ronnie's view. There are two things which remain undone. And I, for one, was quite happy to have Article 23 uh, uh, legislation passed, provided that it doesn't impinge on any of our existing freedoms, which are supposed to continue for 50 years and changed. But after the, this last interpretation, I've completely changed my mind. Because on this occasion, instead of interpreting Article 104 of the basic law relating to taking of the oath, they actually not only interpreted our local ordinance the Oaths and Declaration Ordinance, but actually amended it, making uh, the oath, which was proper at the time it was taken, turning it into an improper oath, and not only that, concluding that these legislators had evinced an intention of not, or rather of refusing to take the oath, thereby losing their seats. Now, once they did that as a president, I'm worried. I think it is important that Hong Kong should maintain its rule of law. And uh, the rule of law would include constitutionalism, which is that um, we should have and respect the constitution, which in our case is the basic law. Uh, it, it does not help Hong Kong in any way to, when it comes to confronting a difficult question, to use emotive language or to use extreme expressions uh, that uh, would only create or, or widen the gap uh, between uh, Beijing and Hong Kong. This uh, is a very funny attitude, Ronnie. They twisted what is language. Funny? They twisted the language of our law. They amended the law for us. This is and exactly say what I'm talking about, Martin. And you say we should not use confrontational language. <laughs> uh, I'm, this is exactly what I'm saying, Martin. I'm sorry. I don't agree with you. Uh, maybe it's because of my profession. You know, I want to solve. I the have questions. the same profession. Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure about your. <laughs> you're both officers you're of the law. <laughs> I can understand, Ronnie, but it's not an exco, is it? It's got to speak as an exco member. Well, yeah. I think that's unfair. You know, first of all, I haven't taken the oath yet. Uh, secondly, uh, you know, over the last the uh, 13 take. years, uh, you know, I've always maintained, you know, the same approach. That is that, you know, you need, in politics, you need to resolve problem by trying to understand the other side's position and then see if you can find some common ground. Well, let me ask you, Martini, because, I mean, former colleagues of yours mm. have become, uh, in fact, colleagues from the De Democratic Party have become um, ministers in both the Learn government and there is one who will be in, in the current government. Mm. Did they have any influence, in your view, a beneficial influence? I don't know. Uh, you've got to ask the liaison office, because they interfere in, in local affairs. It, it's not that I doubt the integrity of Hong Kong people whether they formally belong to my party or not. But how much leeway are, are they being given? That's the point. Like the new chief executive, um, I'm sure she means well, but how much freedom will she be given? That's the main point. You cannot allow a mem your member to join the government when we don't even have democracy. You know, if we, we form a government, a coalition government, fine, then you're in it together, all right? But, but no, they just take one of you there and the whole bunch of the, they are, belong to the other camp, e effectively. And they all take orders from the liaison office. Then what do you do? But I think they have to clean up their act. And, uh, but I think Carrie Lam has said uh, more than once, not only during the campaign, 
but after the campaign, that, that she doesn't want, you know, the liaison office to, uh, you know, to get in the way. Uh, you, you think she has the power to do that? I think she can try, and let's see what happens. Well, seeing what happens is what we do. Thank you both very much indeed. Uh, we're going to be back after the break and see you then. Welcome back. During his tenure as Hong Kong's last governor, Chris Patton was called all sorts of names by Chinese top officials and state media. He was labelled a whore, a serpent, a tango dancer and a sinner for a thousand years. But to most people in Hong Kong, he was affectionately known as Fat Pang and remembered for his liking of egg tarts and engagement with the public. Twenty years after boarding the Royal Yacht Britannia to leave Hong Kong, he says the city is still close to his heart. Producer Nina Lowe talked to Chris Patton in London where he recalled his five years as governor as being his happiest years. <laughs> Where in the basic law does it tell me what to do about the nine new functional constituencies? Well, one reason why the British didn't do it more was because Cho En Lai and the Chinese leadership um, warned Britain not to, um, because they said it would make people in Hong Kong um, think they were going to be independent, and that was never going to happen. So you can criticize Britain for not doing more before, but you can't say that China would have loved to have done more because China took exactly the opposite point of view. The last governor of Hong Kong, Chris Patton's new book, First Confession, is in bookstores just before the 20th anniversary of the territory's handover to China. A whole chapter is devoted to the setbacks and challenges he faced while trying to speed up the pace of democracy in Hong Kong. More recently, the former governor has publicly expressed his concerns about the implementation of the basic law and the one country, two systems, and increasing pressure on Hong Kong. We came to London to talk to him. Well, Patton, thank you very much for joining the Pals again here in London. So you said despite all the obstacles that you faced and you regard that five years time in Hong Kong, it was the, the most amazing day and memorable days. Can you tell us more about it? I was aware of the fact that, that for people inside and outside, it was a historic um, responsibility. It was ending the whole uh, idea of colonialism, which nobody would seek to defend in the 20th century. Um, and it was negotiating with China an attempt to ensure that Hong Kong remained what China had promised it would be. Um, a free society with the rule of law and with its own system, which is not a communist or whatever, whatever that means these days, or totalitarian or corrupt system. So for all those reasons, it was fantastic privilege and I'll always be very grateful to the people of Hong Kong for making me so welcome. You know, you've been heavily criticized by, you know, Chinese senior officials and uh, especially, you know, regarding the democracy that you want to speed up the pace of democracy in Hong Kong. So, you know, some Chinese official, they said, if democracy is really that important to Hong Kong people, then why didn't the British do it earlier? I was um, criticized, not for breaking the basic law, but for trying to make the provision of, for elections under the basic law as free and fair as possible. I got ludicrously over-criticized. They turned me into a great democratic hero. The people who were the real democratic heroes were people like Martin Lee and Emily Lau and Cardinal Zen. Um, 
I was simply trying to make the system work as well as possible. Um, and the Chinese rather absurdly um, used all this sort of cultural revolution language about me. But during my five years in Hong Kong, was Hong Kong politically stable? Did you ever have tens of thousands of people on the streets in Hong Kong when I was governor? And um, the only time when there were thousands of people on the streets was when they were, mem when they were remembering the murders in Tiananmen Square. Um, there were never tens of thousands in the streets protesting about um, the government. I don't think guided democracy is democracy. I remember a Chinese official or a Chinese, a Beijing supporter, once saying to me, um, you must understand we're not against elections, we just want to know um, the winner in advance. Well, that's not democracy. Um, so what Hong Kong was offered by Beijing was a system under which China would decide who the candidate should be for the top job, and then Hong Kong could choose between them. Well, that's what's called democracy in Iran. It's not what's called democracy anywhere else. Today is cause for celebration, not sorrow. Now, Hong Kong people are to run Hong Kong. That is the promise, and that is the unshakable destiny. Do you still feel that you know, very strong sense of responsibility that you had to have to you know, speak up for Hong Kong people? Yes, I do, um, because I was part of a government um, which made those commitments um, to Hong Kong under the joint declaration, and I think it would be dishonorable dishonorable not to speak out when it looks as though China is, is resiling from those obligations and promises. But do you find the current government like, you know, they, they're quite quiet over the, you know, human rights issues? I think, I think they're too quiet about human rights issues. I think increasingly as this, 20, as this 21st century rolls on, um, we'll start to see rather more clearly the importance of the relationship between human rights and foreign policy. Um, and I think that um, the government should, rec this British government should recognise that, um, in particular now in Hong Kong. How do you see the implementation of the one country, two systems, and the basic law at the moment? I think it's been very patchy. Um, the Taiwanese um, claim there have been 160 or 170 breaches. I think that's overdoing it. Um, but I think that increasingly, um, in the last few years, there have been um, uh, examples of China overstepping the line. To begin with, the only thing that you could point to was choking back the development of democracy, despite the promises that people had been that had been made by People's Daily, by Liu Ping and others, that Hong Kong should determine its own um, system of voting for the Legislative Council. Despite that. Um, on the whole, China, was let, China left Hong Kong to get on with things. President Xi Jinping is due to go to um, Hong Kong any moment now. And I very much hope that he will take the opportunity to reaffirm China's commitment to two systems and not one country, one system. And it's very important, I think, for China to understand the importance of that. And China will play quite properly a more important role in the, tw in the 21st century than in the 20th. And one thing people will need to be able to depend on is China keeping its word. But do you also you know, worry about the integrity of civil servants or even the police forces? Because even Lan Chen Yang, he said during the Occupy Central, the umbrella movement, that um, the most difficult decisions that he has to make is to make sure that the police will execute the um, political order. I don't think it's, um, it's a job of government to give political orders to the police. The police are there to protect everybody's human rights. Everybody's human rights not to be burgled. Everybody's human rights not to be attacked in the street. Everybody's human rights to demonstrate peacefully. Um, that's the role of policing in a free society. Finally, if you had to name one area in which you would like to have done you know, better for Hong Kong, what would it be? Oh, I think I would like to have um, started earlier on uh, 
the development of Hong Kong's um, democracy within the rule of, of within what was in the basic law, and I think I would have um, I, I would have not wasted as much as much time trying to negotiate things with the Chinese government that they were never going to agree to. Um, it's called I think the Chinese call it the struggle school of diplomacy, um, and I think they were never going to be happy unless I was turned into a lame duck. Um, and a representative from Bay for Beijing in Hong Kong rather than Hong Kong's representative in Beijing and London. Mm -hmm. So, Lord Patton, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much indeed. indeed. Pleasure to talk to you. Well, that's it from us for this week. Next week, we'll be looking at other aspects of the 20th anniversary. We'll leave you with more images of Xi Jinping's visit and hopefully see you next week. Goodbye. Boy, take me down the street, chop, 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 hop, 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 ding, ho, ding, dong.